Hi there, Smart Drivers talking tonight about traffic signs. Traffic signs are to driving what instructions are to an IKEA cabinet. <laughs> Only when people get in trouble do they look at the road signs along the roadway. Reading road signs. For those of you new to Smart Drive Test, my name is Rick August. I was a truck driver in the 1990s, uh, licensed commercial driving instructor in 1997, uh, earned my doctorate in legal history from the University of Melbourne in 2006. And uh, while I was going to university in Melbourne, I drove buses for Greyhound and one of the regional bus lines there as well. And then in 2015, I started the online YouTube channel. It has been wildly more successful than I could have ever imagined. And uh, if you want to know more about me and more about Smart Drive Test, uh, you can check that over out at the autobiography at Smart Drive Test. Okay, smart videos to have a look at. Totally commit to merging. What are continuity lines? Continuity lines are white lines on on ramps and acceleration lanes. Uh, they're tw uh, twice as wide and half as long as regular lines, and they tell you that the lo the lane that you are going to that you are in, if the continuity lines are on your left. The, the lane that you are in is either going to exit or end. In the, in the case of an acceleration lane, it's going to end. Okay, and avoiding potholes, how to do that um, well to prevent damage to the suspension on your vehicle. So traffic signs convey information in three ways, the shape of the sign, the color, and the writing or symbols thereon. That is what uh, how traffic signs convey inter, in, uh, information. So construction signs, temporary condition signs, for example, have an orange background and black lettering thereon. Okay, road sign classes, classifications of road signs, regulatory signs, school signs, cautionary signs, lane control signs, object marker signs. There are other signs and more categories to this, but these are the main signs of road signs. All right, object marker signs. These are the most prolific signs along our roadways and these will tell you of fixed objects that you're going to run into concrete islands concrete barriers bridge embutments uh, traffic uh, islands uh, signs uh, lamp posts just about anything you can think of uh, and they're hash marks left and right or they are the um, chevron which tells you you can pass on the right or the left and these are important if you're pulling a trailer or driving a larger vehicle because you need to stay away from these fixed objects to compensate for off-tracking when you go around corners. And think of it like a kettle of water pouring onto the hash mark. Which way the kettle of water, the water pours off the hash mark is the side on which you pass the hazard obstruction sign. Regulatory signs, uh, railway crossing signs, not in the province of British Columbia. Tim did correct me on that. <laughs> that railway signs are their own classification. They're not part of the regulatory signs, but stop signs, speeding signs, uh, brake check signs, these are all regulatory signs. Regula uh, the root word of regulatory is regulation, which means it is the law and you must obey these signs. And on a driving test, action contrary to a regulatory sign is an automatic fail on your driver's test. Cautionary signs. Some of these are just simple cautionary signs that give you a little bit of information. Others will save your life. For example, if you're hauling a camper van or a bigger vehicle or those types of things, then uh, 11 feet, 8 inches is very important. The maximum height of a vehicle allowed on roadways in North America is 13 feet, 6 inches or in metric 4.15 meters. So if you are driving a vehicle that is legal height, you are not going to get under 11 feet, eight inches. And we all love watching those bridge fail videos where the truck tries to go under the bridge and doesn't make it. And then the police show up and ask the driver what he or she is doing. And they're saying, I'm taking a break. I'm just moving a bridge. Ba -dum -ba -dum. Okay. Curves, corners, and turns will give you, if it is a sharp turn, it will give you a cautionary speed. So these are some of the cautionary signs. Uh, object marker signs, as I talked about previously, warning you of fixed objects along the way, uh, the roadway, are cautionary signs. Larger vehicles, if you're driving a larger vehicle, you decide to get yourself a big jacked up F-350 with a horse trailer on it. Uh, destination signs are going to become important because you're going to be taking breaks and you want to know how far it is to the next set of uh, fuel pumps or the next restaurants, those types of things, overhead signs, matching speed of the flow of traffic and whatnot, okay? So paying attention to road signs is going to be very important as you get into bigger and bigger vehicles. 
Lane usage signs, these are going to be very important for your driver's test. If you have two left turning lanes, you always wanna be in the outside lane because when you get around the corner, that way you don't have to move back to the right-hand lane. You're in the lane that you need to be in when you get around the corner on left turns, that is, okay? Right turns, if you're driving a larger vehicle, you wanna be in the outside lane, but if you're driving a car, you can be in the inside lane. All right, uh, in the spring, these become really important if you're driving a bigger vehicle because the road markings are worn off because of plowing and sanding and traffic and whatnot, and they have to be repainted in the summertime. All right, so uh, overhead work in concert with road marking signs. So pay attention to your road marking signs or road markings as well. Mile marker signs. <coughs> every state, every province has mile markers along the highways and routes. Uh, and oftentimes they're in conjunction with exits. So exit 57 will be mile marker 57 as well. If you can get these when you're using Google Maps, or you're using your GPS, you're using the app on your phone and those types of things, it's going to be a lot easier and it's going to be part of your defensive driving because if you don't know where you're going, for example, and you're getting off at exit 75 and you're at exit 73, you know that you've got two miles that you need to get over into the right-hand lane so that you can get off at your exit. Remember the saying, good drivers sometimes miss their exit, bad drivers never miss their exit, okay? They'll do that driving right across three lanes of traffic to get to their, ex their um, exit. And know this, the, every state, every province has mile markers and the exit numbers are one and the same as the mile markers. The state of New York likes to be different. In the state of New York, it is not the same in, the, in that state, okay? In the Empire State there. So good luck on your driver's test. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great day. Or no, not have a great day. I'm coming back. <laughs> traffic signs. Read your traffic signs. Be able to understand traffic patterns and interpret the individual actions of each road user on the roadway and that way you can reduce being caught out and having to react to what's going on in traffic rather you can manage space around your vehicle figure out what's going on with the traffic and predict and respond you want to be able to respond to traffic not react because oftentimes you're not going to be able to react in time yes lots of stuff going on especially with summertime busy 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 lots of traffic out and know that this is the most dangerous time of the year to drive. So it's more important to manage space around your vehicle. Dylan, how do I get better at scanning? I'm new to driving and I always feel like I'm blankly staring at the road in front of me. Okay, so Dylan, Corey will put up the video for you on seeing and scanning patterns, but essentially, you know, it's far down the road, in check your center mirror, far down the road, left wing mirror, far down the road, check your right wing mirror, far down the road, then in, in check your instrument panel and you want to be doing that every 10 to 15 seconds while you're driving scanning and having that uh, scanning pattern in place it's easy to get kind of lulled into that false sense of driving with what's going on and because driving is spatial orientation and it's a right brain activity as opposed to a left brain activity the right brain is not able to determine uh artificial time so therefore we can get kind of caught out with that blank stare where we're kind of looking at traffic and getting mesmerized by what's going on and those types of things so you got to kind of fight against that by continually scanning keeping your head moving figuring out what's going on with traffic patterns interpreting traffic patterns and interpreting what's going on with individual road users that's what you need to be doing when you're driving all right, and we're going to talk about traffic signs as well because you need to be scanning for the traffic signs, the road signs, and reading those because those are going to give you information about the roadway so that you can be a safer, smarter driver. Colton, have you ever had a student driver in a truck with you when the brakes uh, lost all air pressure? Colton, I've never been in a truck ever <laughs> that has lost air pressure, okay? Uh, this is the other piece. And just on that note of air brakes, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about CDL vehicles, uh, buses and trucks, uh, school buses that are all fitted with air brakes. Okay. In this day and age, it is unlikely, very rare that they are going to lose air pressure. 
The reason I say that is that the air compressors are bolted right to the side of the engine. They're parasitic. They take uh, their power from the engine. They take their lubrication system from the engine and they're capable of pumping 500 pounds per square inch, which is far, far more than you ever need for any air brake system. And believe it or not, air compressors and air brake systems the biggest draw on an air brakes uh, system and then the air compressor specifically is not the air brakes. The biggest draw on the air brake system is in fact the air, air ride suspension. That's what draws the most air from the air ride suspension or the uh, air ride system, the air compressor. That's what uses the most amount of air because every time it's not like airbags uh, in a pickup truck. It's just a balloon. When you put airbags in a pickup truck, uh, you go over a bump and they squish down and they go back up. In a semi truck, when you go over a bump, it actually evacuates some of the air from the airbag and you have to pump that airbag back up. Saying that, <laughs> trucks have so many fail safes to prevent them from losing air pressure. Uh, and if they do lose air pressure in the unlikely event that they will, uh, there's all kinds of bells and whistles inside the vehicle, uh, low air warnings and whatnot, safety systems, spring brakes and whatnot, that you're never going to lose air pressure on an air brake system. Now, saying that, all of us have driven through the mountains and we're all afraid of runaway ramps and those types of things and, you know, trucks losing brakes. They do, the brakes do fail. They only have one failing, which is brake fade, which is you overheat the brakes. You use too much. You're trying to slow down. Well, in the United States, as an average load, is about 80,000 pounds, which is 40 tons. You're trying to slow down 40 tons going down the hill. And if you're not using the auxiliary braking correctly, because all these machines, these big semi trucks are fitted with uh, engine retarders and driveline retarders, uh, auxiliary braking systems. Uh, and those uh, auxiliary braking systems if you're in the proper gear going down the hill, we'll hold the vehicle back and you'll have to use the brake pedal very little. New drivers and drivers that don't get the right kind of training don't do that and they overheat the brakes and then they have to use one of those runaway lanes because they burnt their brakes out. That is a failing of A, training and B, the driver not getting the training that he or she needs to get that vehicle down the hill safely. So brake fade is overheating the brakes. Any system, any machine has a limitation. Okay, your lawnmower, for example, has a limitation. Your lawnmower is designed to cut grass that's probably three or four inches high. If you get into grass that's six or eight inches high, your lawnmower won't cut it. It'll just uh, kill the motor. It'll stall. Uh, you know, your car, for example, will only go a certain speed. It will only do 90 miles an hour. And then it's got a governor and it stops and that's as fast as it will go. Every machine has a limitation and air brake systems too have a limitation on how much braking they can provide. And cars are the same. If you hooked a trailer up to your car and went down a hill, you could potentially experience brake fade with your brakes from overusing them. Same thing uh, now in this time of year in the summertime, you see all these pickup trucks, the F-150s, the Fords, are the not the Fords, the Fords F-150s, the Dodge Rams and whatnot. They're sitting on the side of the road with their camper trailer because they blew the transmission out of it because the people at the caravan shop when they bought their camper trailer never said to them, uh, you need a transmission cooler on that. They never told them that and now they blew the transmission out of it because they overheated it. So limitations on air brakes. Vagabond, uh, brake fade, yes. Uh, Marion, yep, Coca Hollow is a great one for overheating the brakes and they start smoking, seeing it often. Yes, they do because that first part of the Coca Hollow uh, and the Donner Pass in the US, they talk about that as well. Uh, the squ Snow Squall Ami is another one in the United States. Uh, 10 Mile Hill uh, coming into Golden is another one. But again, I have seen and been behind Super Bs. Loaded to the max, uh, Super Bs are 140,000 pounds. They're 63,000, 63,500 kilograms. And I have been behind these vehicles and going down a hill and never touched a brake. Never seen the brake lights come on all the way down the hill because they had it in the right gear with the auxiliary braking, the engine braking on full, and they just go down the hill and everything holds back. I mean, in this day and age, auxiliary brakes are just incredible. There's, the technology has advanced so much that it's just awesome, incredibly awesome. 
Uh, Tim says better still add a te transmission temperature gauge. Yes, uh, that's going to work for you, Tim, but that's still not going to prevent the transmission from overheating if you don't have, if you haven't added a coolant, the, the coolant lines from the radiator back to the transmission. Uh, and this is one of the issues with, uh, we talk about here in, in North America, we have uh, engine brakes for auxiliary braking on semi trucks. Whereas in, in Europe, they have um, driveline retarders, hydraulic driveline retarders. The problem with hydraulic driveline retarders are the same as manual or automatic transmission. They're essentially a, a, a hydraulic pump. And because they're a hydraulic pump and you're trying to squeeze a lot of oil through a very small space, it creates a lot of heat. And it's the same thing with the hydraulic. It's the same thing. Automatic transmissions, hydraulic driveline retarders, both have to have coolants on them to dissipate that excess heat. That's what, that's what it is. Joe, hello, my friend. Uh, elevator, my mom and I were brake checked one day coming home from Lafayette, Indiana on Hoosier Heartland Highway. Yeah, and that's unfortunate. Um, yes, and Tim, yes, if I was going to get a pickup truck with an automatic transmission in it, I would also, while well, the same time that they're adding the transmission cooler, <laughs> the coolant lines back to the transmission, I would also get them to put in that gauge as well. And a lot of the semi trucks, uh, will have that transmission gauge as well. They'll have the transmission gauge and they'll have a heat gauge for both rear axles as well. So you know when it's going on. And the Peterbilts and high-end Kenworths and those types of things, they'll all have um, engine oil temperature. So they'll be able to, they give you temperature gauges on everything in the truck where you're running up and down the road. Uh, yes, and what Tim just said, yes, when you have a gauge, then you can pull over and stop before you cook the transmission, before you overheat and completely do the transmission in. It's the same thing as, you know, when that little magic genie light comes on on the dash there, that means that your engine is running too low on oil and that you need to pull over to the side of the road uh, right away. Uh, CBC, uh, passed my driving test in the US, super easy, was worrying the night before. Yes, and that tends to happen and it tends, and then what happens is you go in and if you're well prepared, then the test isn't too hard at all. So excellent, excellent, excellent. Marion asked me what a regen system is. All right, so uh, regen systems. <laughs> yes, this was the solution to large semi trucks with big diesel engines in them that it's the environmental apparatus within the truck. And what happens is when the motor burns really hot, the byproduct from burning diesel fuel sits in a chamber and it gets really hot and it simply burns all of those bad chemicals and whatnot. Of course, there's probably a whole bunch of other chemical things that are going on and I would need to do some research for you. Now, if you run up and down the road in the big truck and it's running hot all the time because it's pulling and you're going up and down the highway and you do that for a couple hours, it'll completely, it'll keep the regen system cleaned out. However, if you're running around the city all the time and you're sh turning the truck off and you're shutting it off, the engine off and turning the engine back on and shutting it off and turning it back on and those lots of things. Now, here's the environmental part that doesn't work very well, okay? The system works awesome as long as the truck runs up and down the highway and, and the engine gets super hot and it blows out all, all that bad stuff out and burns it, right? If that doesn't happen and the engine doesn't get hot enough, what it will do is it will go into regeneration. The truck will shut down literally until you do a regen, a regen on the engine. So basically what you're doing is you're sitting on the side of the road for 20 minutes to 35 minutes with the engine roaring <laughs> at about 2000 RPM. And the whole thing just feels like it's coming apart to make the engine hot enough to burn all of that bad stuff out of the regeneration system to be environmental. So that's what the regeneration system is. Now, fortunately, when I drove truck, the regeneration system wasn't there. The DEF uh, fuel, uh, the DEF fluid, diesel exhaust fluid, and the regeneration system. These came in just as I was leaving the industry, but this is my understanding of what it is on these trucks. Uh, Tim says Google for the manual of standard traffic signs and pavement markings if you want to see all of them. There you go. Excellent. Thank you for that, Tim. Uh, okay. Corey's put up the sign on heights, overhead heights for large vehicle semi trucks. You're hauling uh, trailers with hay on them, horse trailers, uh, large yachts. You know, you're 
walking hog, uh, hawking those things around and whatnot. So have a look at all of that. All right. Uh, regeneration cycle for emissions control system. Is that all I can say for sure. Yes, it is. That's what it is. Uh, Colton, the only gauge you never see in a car is a differential temperature gauge. Yes, uh, I, I can't say yet that I have seen a differential temperature gauge in a car. I, there's a lot of gauges I've seen in big trucks that I would never seen in a car. Uh, the other one, the, the, actually the one gauge that I did like, and I, the only trucks that I saw it on were Kenworth. Uh, these were the best gauges to teach new drivers how to drive was, uh, boost gauges on the turbocharger. So, so all trucks, uh, okay, we'll just, we'll back up here a little bit on turbochargers. So turbochargers, you need two things to make an engine go. Okay, you need fuel, either diesel fuel or gasoline, and you need air. You need those two things to make an engine go. Now, if you want to make the engine go faster, you need more air. Okay, putting more fuel into the engine is easy. You just put a bigger pump on it, okay? Putting more air into it is not so easy. But the way that we've done this now is, is that we put turbochargers on them. And tur turbochargers are awesome. There's two kinds of uh, ways that you can ram force air into an engine. Superchargers, turbochargers. Superchargers are parasitic because they actually take a belt and they turn a fan and they push air into the engine. Now, they take a little bit of uh, energy from the engine to run the supercharger. They do work. <laughs> Tracy's Audi S5, S4 has a V6 supercharger. Now, off the bottom end, thing goes. Turbochargers are not parasitic, okay? They run off the exhaust gases. The issue with them is, is that when you're spooling the turbine to push the other turbine to ram force air into the engine, the engine has to be at top capacity. Um, it, and there has to be a lot of exhaust gases coming out of the engine to spool that turbine. Okay, the nice thing about turbochargers though is, is that they're not parasitic. So I lost, got lost in that with turbochargers. Somebody asked me a question about, right, turbo boost gauges. This is what I was talking about. So the turbo boost gauges tell you how much force, how much air you're ramming into the engine. And you, it can tell you when, it spool, when the engine spools up. And when I was teaching new drivers how to drive manual transmissions and anybody who has experience with driving manual transmissions, the engine gets to a certain point and then you shift to the next gear. With a turbocharger and a boost gauge, it'll it'll come up and it'll be climbing as the as it's getting more kind of steady pressure of pushing air into the engine, but then it gets to a point where it's called winding out. There's too much pressure, there's too much spinning of the turbine. And just as it goes, the turbo boost comes up like this and then it just kind of levels over when it hits that sweet spot where it's between climbing steadily and just walking off, is what I used to call it, with the students, that's when you shift the gear to the next gear because that is your optimum fuel economy. Uh, and I don't know whether we could figure out how to do something with cars where we could put that in because most cars now have small engines in them. They have like 1.9 liter engines in them, four cylinder engines with a turbocharger on them. Now, if we could put a boost gauge on them, because you know, especially in Europe, all of these are manual transmissions, then it could optimize fuel economy on these vehicles. Of course, you know, there's nothing more sexy in my mind, you know, because I'm an ex truck driver of the spooling up of a turbocharger, that high wine. <laughs> Just, you know, watch some of the videos here on YouTube on the tractor pulls when they get when they get hooked up to the sled and they start winding the motor up and you can hear the turbo start to spool up and that's what they're doing. Uh, is basically doing that launch control to get that thing going. Okay, I digress. All right, uh, Marion, you're most welcome. Uh, Carol, how do you smooth brake without stopping before the stop line? All right, so Carol, excellent question. And a lot of learning drivers have difficulty with this because what happens is they come up and they hold the brake right until the vehicle comes to a stop. And then what happens is you get a really rough stop. Because what happens is the vehicle is two pieces, okay? There's the tires, the suspension, and the frame, which is we call the chassis, and then there's the body of the vehicle. And what happens is, is you're coming forward and you brake, and then the body moves in front of the, of the chassis when you're braking. And if you hold the brake on until you come to a complete shot, stop, what happens is the body moves forward of the chassis, it comes to a complete shot, and then the body slingshots back over the chassis. 
So what you need to do when you come up to a stop is nice, slow, just before the vehicle comes to a complete stop, just let your foot off the brake slightly and then reapply the brake. So what happens is then now it comes up, this goes forward and then it comes back and it nice gently sits back over the vehicle. That's how you come to a nice smooth complete stop when you're stopping the vehicle. So just as you come to a complete stop, just before the vehicle stops rolling, release pressure on the brake, let the body settle back over the chassis, I'll reapply the brakes and then come to a complete stop. You'll get a nice smooth stop that way. Uh, elevator some signs will warn you within half a mile of the exit. Yes, they will. And so will the GPS, the app on your phone. It will tell you annoyingly seven or eight times, take the exit in 100 meters, take the exit now. And you know, if you don't take the exit, then it'll be like, return to the route, return to the route, return to the route. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then you can have it in all those different accents. You can have it like in a British accent or an Australian accent, or, you know, English is a second language accent, which is really annoying. Return to the road, return to the road, return to the road. And you just like, you want to find that person in the phone and you just want to slap them because it's like, really? Come on. Uh, Marion, feathering the brakes. Yes. No, feathering the brakes is something different than that defensive stopping, uh, Marion, because you're actually applying the brakes, releasing the brakes, and then holding them back on. Feathering the brakes is when you're kind of just applying and just kind of feeling what's going on. And as you're coming into your first winter, Marion, uh, you're gonna find out uh, that feathering the brakes is something that you wanna do to figure out whether you're driving on slippery conditions. That's what you wanna do, okay? Uh, <laughs> Jay, I'm not really sure what it is. I was just having fun with that because, you know, return to the root, return to the root. How many times I've heard that and it just drives me crazy. Uh, Joe, can you advise on how best to manage acceleration, deceleration? Okay, Joe, it's going to depend on where you are and what the situation is, what kind of vehicle you have. Uh, and I like this when you're talking about acceleration uh, on electric vehicles because electric vehicles are so heavy. They have so much acceleration and so much torque that they're tearing tires off them, right? <laughs> on a regular ICE car, an internal combustion engine car, you're gonna get 60 to 80,000 kilometers, which is what, 40 to 60,000 miles on a set of tires. These electric cars are getting half that on tires because there's so much torque and they weigh 40% more. Okay, so they're really tearing up the tires. Now, acceleration, uh, the other piece on that, uh, Joe, is what you wanna do is you wanna put the heel of your foot on the floor and then curl your toes and just use that on the brake, nice and easy. The other thing that I would suggest to you is go to a parking lot, park the vehicle back out, get used to the primary controls, the brake, the accelerator, and the steering wheel, when you're doing slow speed maneuvers and that's gonna help you out, all right? Uh, Raven, how many practice hours do you recommend for older adults? Uh, Raven, the general rule, this doesn't apply to everybody, but the general rule is for, hey, yes, I'm doing a live stream and Striker is over there barking out the window because he can probably see the cat in the backyard. Uh, for every 10 years that you're over 20 years old, you want to do 10 more hours of practice. Okay. So if you're 30 years old, you're probably going to do another 10. If you're 40 years old, you're probably going to do another 20 hours of practice. But again, it depends on the individual and your aptitude for driving and those types of things. And there are techniques, skills, training exercises that you can put in place that will accelerate your learning. Okay. And make it go faster. For example, doing slow speed maneuvers in a parking lot is going to make you a, a better driver faster. You're going to learn faster because you're able to isolate parts of the driving uh, education that you need to put in place. So do that and that way you're not gonna have to spend as much time learning how to drive, all right? Okay, uh, Mary and I have the when possible make a U-turn on my phone. Yes, <laughs> love that one. Yes, when possible make a U-turn. Uh, we were driving in Vancouver and we got lost uh, east and west. And we get Google, for whatever reason, sent us south and we were supposed to go north. 
and we didn't notice i didn't notice when i got directions that the address north was north so we went south and then it, it kept you know when possible make a u-turn and we in canadian culture canadian driving culture u-turns are not part of our driving experience it's not it's not part of our culture it's not something we do whereas in parts of the united states it's part of their driving culture. So for us doing U-turns, I mean, we can do U-turns. We're very capable of it, but you know, we're very polite about it because we're Canadians, eh? Uh, <laughs> it's just not part of our driving uh, culture. So when we're asked to do a U-turn, we're like, really, is, you know, is, is that safe? Like, can we do that? Is that okay with you? Like we're asking the other drivers and road users, is it okay if I make a U-turn here? Do you mind? Right, because you know, we're, uh, Tim says, never stop practicing. If you don't use it, you'll lose it. And that is absolutely right. My friend, <laughs> uh, give striker my regards. Awesome. We'll do Raven all the best. Uh, excellent. Okay. Elevator. What does it mean when something slingshots, uh, elevator? It means that something snaps. <laughs> it means that all of a sudden something goes from perfectly stopped to whoosh, that's slingshotting. Uh, also, there's generally some way that you can get extra oomph on taking off. Uh, for example, let me try and think of something. What would be something that slingshots? Um, I'll need to think of something. I'll just keep it in the back of my mind and remind me of it. Uh, Colton, those pulling tractors sound sweet when the turbo spools up. Uh, the ones that have turbo shaft engines sound even crazier. Yeah, it's just like some of these things are kind of crazy. And uh, one of them came across my Twitter feed a couple of weeks ago where it was like a semi truck. It was an old Ford 9000, <laughs> the industry standard in the 1970s, you know, rough as guts. These things, they had zero suspension in them and, you know, just break the back of any truck driver. And uh, this thing's pulling the sled down the, down the track and gets about halfway down the track. And the engine, the entire engine just like flopped <laughs> Out over the front not sure all the dynamics and forces that were going on there but the you know this this thing is just like tearing up the track and all of a sudden the engine just like whoop <laughs> and the thing just comes to a stop klaus 1.9 turbo diesels are big uh sadly 1.5 liter engines just little lunch boxes with no feeling power in it uh yeah 1.5 <laughs> is not much of an engine at all uh, I was telling you a few weeks ago I went down to Victoria and I rented a car it was a Nissan kick and it had a three cylinder in it with an automatic behind it. And it was a three cylinder with no, uh, it was, didn't have any, what am I trying to say? A turbocharger or a supercharger or anything. And you step on it, it, it you know, it kind of looks at you and goes, pardon, are you sure you want to go? <laughs> it was just like, you know, if it had a six speed manual transmission, it would have been really fun. But with an automatic transmission behind a, like a, 100 horsepower engine you're just like yeah no no uh carol when the instructor instructor says pull over to the right do you turn back to see your blind spot for the bike lane or do you just look uh at the right view mirror no uh carol every time that you change directions of the vehicle you have to shoulder check all right shoulder check shoulder check shoulder check so if they're asking you to move over to the right okay shoulder check check your mirror uh, look forward again and then shoulder check again and then start moving over into the right hand lane every time you change directions of the vehicle shoulder check in the direction that you're going to move the vehicle all right not shoulder checking is to driving what not checking to see if a weapon is loaded is to gun safety okay you would never pick up a weapon and not check to see whether it was loaded before handling that firearm okay just act ask alec baldwin okay always always check a weapon to see whether it's loaded when somebody hands it to you it's the same thing with a car every time you change directions of that vehicle shoulder check and make sure that there isn't somebody there and i'm telling you right now a lot of people are like oh you don't have to shoulder check you just drove past that spot yeah it may not save you now it may not save you next week it may not save you next month it may not save you in three years but in five years something's going to happen and there's going to be somebody in your blind area and you're going to be very happy that you hone that, that, that habit and kept that habit in place to keep yourself safe when you're driving on the roadway. Uh, Michael, I practiced my three-point turn today. Awesome. That's great. Uh, Marion, it has no guts. Yes, that is absolutely right, my friend. <laughs> absolutely no guts. Uh, Mallory, if you're driving in uh, with a trailer, make sure it's properly secured to your vehicle. Yes. Yes, make sure it is properly secured and make sure that the latch 
that latches the uh, tongue onto the ball, you know, crank it down, latch it, secure the latch, and then crank it back up and make sure that it's actually hooked onto the ball on the, on the back of the truck. Because there are times you'll hook that thing down, flip the latch, and the latch won't catch onto the ball, and it'll just pop off. Of course, you've got your safety chains hooked on. But, you know, I really don't like checking out the tensile strength of safety chains on a trailer. <laughs> I would just rather make sure that, you know, I crank it back up and I make sure that it is actually hooked to the ball and it's not going to fall off. And it's the same thing. Truck drivers, incredibly lazy, okay? I was paranoid about the semi-trailer falling off the back of the truck. Every time I hooked onto a semi-trailer, I got on there with a flashlight and I made sure that the jaws, the, the jaws of the kingpin, or the jaws of the fifth wheel rather, were locked around the kingpin, that it was not going to come off the back of the, the back of the truck. And even if I went in and I left the truck or I was sleeping, I got up in the morning, I always made sure it went out and that made sure that that uh, hitch point on the semi-trailer was secure. Now, most guys, most truck drivers will just back into the trailer, they'll hear it click, and then they'll pull forward and they'll do a pull test on it, okay? That doesn't tell you that the jaws of the fifth wheel are locked around the kingpin. That just tells you the trailer's sitting on the fifth wheel, okay? And it may there may be just enough there to hold it there in the little time that you do that pull test. Now, story about that. We had one of the driving instructors at the driving school just before I left the driving school industry. He did that. That was his thing with his students. They back into the trailer, do a little pull test, good to go. Guess where they dropped the trailer? Right on the highway. Trailer come off the back of the truck, going down the road. And then he was like, oh yeah, now I do a tug test on everything. It's like, yeah, maybe you should just get under there with a flashlight and make sure that the jaws are locked around the kingpin, rather. So you don't be dropping trailers out on the highway where they're not supposed to be dropped. <laughs> there you go. Uh, excellent. Epic, uh, speaking of another road sign that will appear on your road test, if freeway driving is involved, and exit only signs black on yellow also appear on highways, uh, divided highways that fitted with jog handles as seen in New, New Jersey. Now, for those of you who are not in the state of New Jersey and do not know what jug handles are, jug handles uh, prevent left-hand turns at intersections. You actually get off to the right, go around, and then you drive straight through the intersection instead of making a left-hand turn. It's actually kind of a clever engineering idea. The only issue with it is it takes up a great deal of real estate at the intersection because the intersection becomes much, much bigger. They are an excellent idea because they do eliminate the left-hand turn at the intersection. They put in these jug handles. So that kind of signage, as Epic is saying, uh, is there to tell you about jug handles. And for those of you who are taking your license in the state of New Jersey, that you want to be looking for these jug handles, and if they are within vicinity of where you're taking your test at the DMV, you want to practice with these and make sure that you know how to do uh, navigate through jug handles safely to keep yourself safe and to pass your driver's test. One, two, three, I passed my driver's test today. Thanks for your help. You are most welcome, my friend. Congratulations on passing your test. That is absolutely awesome. Uh, elevator is missing your exit automatic fail on a driver's test. Uh, elevator, it's unlikely that you're going to go on the interstate or highway on your driver's test. Most people are not. Okay, they're just not going to. The First and foremost, the DMV is oftentimes too far away from where the interstates or freeways are. Now, if you do miss your exit or you do get lost on a driver's test, that is not an automatic fail, okay? You missed it. Maybe you missed it just because you were nervous or the driving examiner didn't give you proper instructions. But also know that it's unlikely that you're going to miss an exit because you're going to be in the right lane anyway because you're going to be doing the speed limit and because you're doing the speed limit you're going to be in the right hand lane so the driving examiner is going to give you lots of notice he or she is really good at giving directions they know that you're nervous they know that you don't have a great deal of experience so they're going to do their best to get you off on to uh off on the exit uh mallory what is a fifth wheel on a big truck okay so a fifth wheel it's not the spare tire <laughs> excellent so one of the ways that you can hook a trailer up to a truck is with a fifth wheel and it's basically a plate. It's a round circle, looks like a, it looks like a wheel <laughs> and it's got a slot in it at the back 
and there's a pin on the bottom of the trailer and that pin slides into the fifth wheel. So the trailer is actually sitting on this plate on the back of the truck. And the reason they use fifth wheels on big semi trucks is because it's called a semi trailer. And semi means it's partial. It's just part of a unit, okay? It's part of a bigger unit, which is the towing unit, the tractor, okay? The road tractor or the, uh, the prime mover. It's the prime mover or the tractor. In North America, we call it the tractor. Uh, in Europe, they call it the prime mover. And it's the engine that basically tows the semi-trailer. And the reason they use semi-trailers is they found out from horse the horse-drawn days that horses can pull more than they can carry. And it's the same thing with trucks. They can pull more than they, they can carry. So they use a fifth wheel and they put they set it on this plate so that there is a certain amount of, of the overall weight on the back of the truck. Okay, so that's what a fifth wheel is. And as well, it makes the trailer uh, much more stable to tow. And this is where you'll get into uh, big camper vans and horse-drawn trailers and those types of things. These will be fifth wheels because they're more stable and easier to tow because some of the weight is now sitting on the towing unit. Colton, the only time a fifth uh, wheel isn't a wheel is when it's a fifth wheel. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And... Uh, <laughs> I don't know, years ago, I was going down the highway, down the interstate in the United States, and there was a truck in front of me, and it was one of those Dominion trucks or yellow trucks, you know, yellow doesn't exist anymore, but, um, you know, one of those LTL companies, and they had two fifth wheels on the back of the truck, and I got on the radio, and of course, being the smart ass that I am, I said to the driver, I said, oh, you got two fifth wheels on the back of your truck. I said, uh, is that in case one goes flat? <laughs> I never did find out why there were two fifth wheels on the back of the truck, but it was pretty funny going up and down the road. Uh, Jackson, just the front bumper of my vehicle was sitting uh, in a minor road intersection. That's still part of your vehicle, the front bumper. Uh, Colton, okay, excellent. Uh, Marion, Brees, uh, excellent. Thank you for the compliment. Excellent. Uh, Brooklyn, I have my driver's test tomorrow. Thanks for all you do. You are most welcome, my friend. Uh, so glad that we can help out. Awesome, awesome. Robert, I'm new to this, but not new to driving, and I love the feeling of freedom. And yes, driving is awesome. I have spent my entire career <laughs> driving trucks, teaching people how to drive, and it is just incredibly empowering. Klaus, in Germany, U-turns are part of our driving culture, but I don't know why people don't do this. Uh, here, it's allowed. Yes, it is allowed. I'm not sure either. You know, Maybe it's just we're too polite. That might be it. Jay, though my first trailer dropped, forgot the landing gear, completely noticed that when I dumped the suspension and down went the trailer, I uh, was sitting on the last four inches of fifth wheels. Yes, and uh, <laughs> I, I have been the victim of dropping the kingpin over the front of the fifth wheel and then having to crank the dollies up high enough to get the kingpin to come back over the front of the fifth wheel. That has been a great deal of energy and effort. And uh, I don't know, I don't think that you can. Uh, if you drop the trailer on the ground, I don't know whether you can actually crank the dollies up to lift it back up. Most of the time you have to get a crane in or you have to get a huge forklift in to lift the truck up to be able to get it back up so that you can crank the dollies down so that uh, you can get back under it. Crystal, my friend, how are you? Yeah, the driver didn't reply when... <laughs> I asked him why he had another fifth wheel on the back of his truck. But it was pretty funny. It made me laugh going down the road for sure. Uh, Jackson, I made three mistakes. Hit a curb, failed to yield to the right of way. Uh, left hand turn into an intersection. The front bumper is sitting close. Okay, so you made a couple of other uh, major errors there, and that was not your friend. All right. Uh, elevator flashing brights at left lane squatters isn't part of American culture, as I know. Yes, it is not part of our culture. We're very polite, and we just let people sit in the left lane when, in fact, we should be telling them to get their butts out of the left lane. Uh, that is one of the things that I do like about Europe. People do not camp out in the left lane, uh, you know, because other people get very angry. They come up behind you, and they honk their horn, and they flash their lights. They tell you to get your butt out of the left lane. Uh, Crystal was on vacation in Texas for two weeks. Uh, that sounds lovely. Where were you in Texas for on holidays, my friend? That sounds really fun. Oh, yes, and on ideas of Jesus, my test is next week. Uh, thanks for your videos. I feel more confident. Awesome. That is great, my friend. So glad that we could help out, and you're going to do awesome on your test. Just a bit more practice. Remember to breathe uh, in through the nose, out through the mouth, and that will cause your body to relax for the purposes of your driver's test. 
uh, four components to any driver's test, okay? Space management, observation, communication, and speed control. And I put speed control last because space management is the most important and we use speed to control space, okay? And space management, stopping at the correct stopping position at controlled intersections, behind the stop line, behind the crosswalk or sidewalk. And if those two conditions don't exist, then at the edge of the intersection where they just before coming into the intersection. All right, uh, stopping back in traffic, one vehicle length. So you can see the vehicle, the tires of the vehicle in front of you making clear contact with the pavement. Uh, do not enter an intersection you can't clear. You know, stay away from other things. Uh, keep your two to three second following distance because if you're not near anything, it's less likely that you're going to hit anything. All right, for the purposes of your driver's test. So space management, uh, observation, forward scanning pattern, uh, shoulder checking every time you move the vehicle sideways and reversing. You can use a backup camera, you can use your mirrors, but you still have to look out through the back window. You cannot use a backup camera as your primary line of sight. Doesn't matter what um, what state, what jurisdiction, in your, or where you're taking your driver's test, okay? Communication. There are five ways we communicate with other traffic, okay? Position of the vehicle or road user on the roadway. Uh, is the most important. If a vehicle is in the left turning lane, for example, it's high probability that they're going to turn left. Road user, if there is a pedestrian at the crosswalk, there's a high probability that he or she is going to cross the roadway. So position of the vehicle, lights and signals, uh, eye contact, hand gestures, and lastly, horn. Okay, horn is seen as a sign of aggression in North America, so use it sparingly. If you are on a back residential street and you're driving along, and there's somebody walking along the roadway and not using the sidewalk for whatever reason, maybe just give a little beep on your horn to say, hey, I'm here, just uh, be careful of that. Do you have a look at the bit back when you shoulder check a larger car like a, a minivan? No, okay, it doesn't matter what vehicle you're in when you're shoulder checking, it's simply 90 degrees to whatever side you're looking at, okay, whichever way you're moving the vehicle. So if you're moving it left, your right, my left, okay, you're simply gonna shoulder check. If you're looking your left, my right, okay, shoulder check, 90 degrees. You don't have to turn around. It's just simply 90 degrees because we have 180 degrees of peripheral vision. So when we turn our head over, way over here, we're looking, okay, for light and movement. Uh, Mallory, have a great vacation. Thank you, my friend. Uh, 260, how long do most road tests take? Okay. The length of a road test is going to depend where you're taking your test. If you're in a large metropolitan city like New York or Los Angeles, now Los Angeles may be an exception because there are people that have said to me that the driver's test in the state of California is longer, okay? Up to 20 minutes, 35 minutes. In Los Angeles and large metropolitan areas, it's not longer, it's shorter, okay? New York City, I know that it's five to eight minutes. It's less than 10 minutes. They take you in the car, they go around the block and they come back, okay? Same thing with Los Angeles. Now, if you're in smaller places, rural areas and those types of things, Duluth, Minnesota, you may get a longer test because they don't have as many people at that testing center. So therefore, they take you out for 30, 45 minutes, all right, for your driver's test, so know that. So it's gonna depend on where you take your driver's test on how long your test is going to be. Uh, Curry, never gonna give you up. Yeah, never gonna let you down. Awesome. I just got Rick rolled in the comments. Oh, <laughs> Natalie, uh, what should I do if I'm on a two way lane and a solid yellow line to my left and there is a dump truck stopping constantly in front of me? Can I pass even though a yellow line? Uh, yes, you can pass. So say for example, dump truck in your case, say for example, there's a garbage truck that's stopping to pull to pick up garbage all the time as you're driving along the roadway. Yes, mirror signal shoulder check, move around when they stop, and then mirror signal shoulder check back into your lane. Yes, if there's an obstruction along the roadway, you can do that. And as well, uh, Corey will put up the video for you of me in New York City in the Bronx with Sam, Big Mac Sam, check out his channel too. And I do that exact thing. There are double parked cars along the roadway and I have to move out into the other lane. So it doesn't matter what the road markings are. You can't stay there with an obstruction. You got to go somewhere, right? So mirror signal, shoulder check into the other lane, move around the obstruction and then come back in. So yes, you can do that. Marquilla, 
Uh, my test is tomorrow and I was wondering what I should do before the test and how I become not too cautious to the point it affects how I drive. Okay, just do what you need to do. Take away the driving examiner's right to fail you. Breathe in through the nose, out through the mouth. That will cause your body to relax, all right? Do what you need to do to take away the driving examiner's right to fail you. Nothing less, nothing more, all right? Don't be too cautious. Make sure that you're driving the posted speed limit. Get the vehicle up to speed as quickly as possible. Don't dawdle. Uh, Crystal says it was hot and humid there in Texas, uh, so you must have been along the Gulf Coast somewhere near Corpus Christi, I suspect. Yes, it would have been hot and humid. I have heard that. <laughs> That's why they have hurricanes there in the Gulf. Uh, okay, excellent. Excellent. Uh, Corey put up the video there. Thank you for that, Corey, elevator fan. Uh, farm trackers, tractors are the exception when there are solid yellow lines. How do you mean the exception? No, they're not an exception. I mean, if they're stopping and starting, you got to pass them. If they're going slower than you along the roadway, then you have to pass. Uh, Marion, yes, he's looking forward to it. We're going to be in Ontario and it's going to be awesome. <laughs> All right. Uh, when you turn left into a two lane, do you have to take the left side? Because where I live, they usually take the right side. Yes, that is a good question. And everybody else is participating in social driving and just drifting over into the other lane. For the purposes of a driver's test, you cannot do that, okay? You will fail your driver's test. Left lane to left lane, right lane to right lane, all right? When you go around on the left turn, into the left lane, mirror signal shoulder check after the vehicle gets straight. So around on the left turn when the vehicle gets straight, mirror signal shoulder check, change lanes, and move back over to the right lane. The reason for that, every state has a sign that says slower traffic, stay right. And some people are, y'all, that only applies when you're on the highway. Because they're so cool and they think they know how to drive, that only applies on the highway. Well, I'm sorry, it doesn't apply on the highway. It applies in your driver's test because you're the slowest vehicle on the roadway and get your butt over to the right lane, okay? You're on a driver's test. If you don't do that and the driving examiner will not tell you to do that to get back over to the right lane, you need to get back over to the right lane without the driving examiner telling you that, okay? So do that for the purposes of your driver's test and the driving examiner will tell you. The only time that you stay in the left lane and drive along in the left lane is if the driving examiner tells you within the next couple of blocks that you're gonna take a left turn. All right. Uh, Colton, the worst vehicle to be near is a dump truck with no tarp over a load of rocks uh, because they can fly out and break your windshield. Yes, uh, Colton, most states, most all provinces, as far as I know, out now have tarp laws. And they have those goofy little spring tarp mechanisms anyway that it's so easy to just pop the tarp over. Uh, there aren't too many dump truck loads uh, that aren't covered now. But I know what you're saying because I was driving behind the gold compost truck there's a gold compost truck that was runs along here with compost on it well you know what that is right it's poop and you know there's no tarp on the back of it all the stuff's flying out and i was like i didn't even see the truck i was like three miles behind the truck and this stuff is like bouncing down the highway i'm like what is that stuff yeah it's compost it's it's poop rolling down the highway awesome uh all right excellent all right it's puppy time and he farted. Oh, nice. Nice. Now I have two of them. Striker. Hey, come here. Mm -hmm. Did you open the window or something, please? I was You're... Farting. Yeah, open the door. Striker, come here. Mm -hmm. oh, you're so lazy. You're so lazy. Here's the dog. There's the dog. Yeah, he wants to see what's outside because the door's open because he wasn't allowed outside. Because the neighbors have a dog and he stands at the fence and he's yipping and yapping and he's making noise and he's bugging me a little bit. Yeah, not he's he's not being as smart as he is cute. Cute says super, yeah, you heard me say you were cute. Yes, yes. Look over there and tell all your fans how cute you are. That's what everybody says. Everybody says he's cute. So I'm going to get him a cape. I'm going to get him a cape that says cute is my superpower because that's the superpower he's cute right right and in september he's going to the vet to get tutored don't don't tell him what it really means it's he's going to get tutored tutored okay yes there we go all right so all the best if you've had your driver's test in the last couple of weeks and passed congratulations uh if you weren't successful you are going to get it okay just keep going do what you need to do to pass and if you had a driver's test, if you have a driver's test coming up in the next week or so, 
good luck on that. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great night. Bye now. Bye. Bye, everybody. You're so cool. <laughs> he doesn't look impressed.